of the world we live in. It seems like every day when I wake up, there's something new about this virus going around. This is happening, and that's happening, and this is closing, and this is canceled, and nothing's happening, and flights are canceled, and borders are closed, and people are stuck in their houses in Italy and Spain. I saw a, uh, saw a video today on Facebook. Uh, it was this courtyard of a whole bunch of uh, uh, apartment blocks in Italy. And there was one guy, he had his accordion, and he was playing out his window into the apartment blocks. And there was another lady a couple floors down, and she was banging on her tambourine. And they were singing a great song. And there was another guy up here playing his accordion and stuff. And it was, it was pretty neat because they were making the best of the situation that they were in. Uh, but it was crazy because they can't leave their, their houses or apartments or anything like that. But how many people know we have a God who is good? Amen? Amen. Philippians 4 verse 6 says... Be anxious for everything. No, 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 no. All right, good. We have some, have some Bible scholars here who know the Word of God, right? Be anxious for some things. No? Be anxious for the important things. No, what does it say? Be anxious for nothing. You are not allowed to be anxious for anything, according to the Bible. It says, be anxious for for nothing. If you have anxiety about anything, you can bring that to Jesus and say, Jesus, look, you know, you know, as Christians, it's good. I think it's important that we need to be real with Jesus. You know, I think sometimes we, it, it's, we think we have to be holy and I can't think these thoughts. No, I think it's okay to be real with God and say, God, you know, I, I'm, I'm struggling with this. This is causing me fear. This is causing me anxiety. Help me with this, because you said, don't be anxious for anything. Be anxious for nothing. And so use it as a time of communion with God, because he wants you to grow in this. It says, be anxious for nothing. But what? In all things, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known unto God. So we have the prayer, we have the supplication, but... We add into the mix Thanksgiving because Thanksgiving gets our eyes on the goodness of our God and what he has given to us. So Thanksgiving removes the anxiety and says, God, you've given me so much. You've given me so much. You've taken care of me. You've done this. You've been a faithful father like we've just been singing about. So I know you're going to be faithful through all this as well. So make your requests known unto God. That's what Philippians 4 verse 6 says. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. God did not give us a spirit of fear. Is that right? God did not give us a spirit of fear. So if you're feeling a spirit of fear, that's not from God. That feeling of fear, that spirit of fear is not from God. But God gave us a spirit of power. Love and a sound mind. Power, love, and a sound mind. Sometimes when people are filled with a spirit of fear, the sound mind kind of goes out the window. And they start buying toilet paper until there's no toilet paper left in the entire store. And I don't know why people need toilet paper if they have a fever. To me, it doesn't make sense. But that's where the sound mind kind of goes out the window, and then we grab a hold of the fear. Let's be people who live with a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Amen? In regards to all of this COVID-19 stuff, from a church point of view, I, want, I, I need to tell all of us uh, about a few things. The first thing that we want to encourage all of you guys to do is pay attention to what's going on, but be careful where you're getting your information from. We don't, want to, we don't want you guys to be full of fear, but we want you to be well informed about things that are happening. And a lot of things that we see that are going on are people outside of the church or outside of this spirit of power, love, and of a sound mind. They're, they're uh, responding to this out of fear. 
And so sometimes because they're doing something out of fear, we have to respond to what they're doing, but let's do it with a sound mind. Amen? So when you're getting your information, mix it with a sound mind, power, and love. And don't be people who just lock your doors and, you know, keep everything all locked up and don't, you know, we don't want to do that. We don't want to be full of fear. Okay? So be careful where you get your information from. Secondly, here in Cambodia, we want to make sure that we are uh, doing the things that our government tells us to do as well. You know, we want to be responsive and we want to uh, honor the authorities that, that are over us. And so we want to pay attention to the governmental authorities that are here as well. And so let's just kind of keep up on the news and, and keep in contact with your friends. A lot of the information, a lot of the good information that I've received personally is not so much from uh, news sources, but it's actually from some of my friends who have different connections here in the city. So make sure that you're uh, staying connected with people. Uh, thirdly, there are no, as of right now, as of today, things may change tomorrow, we don't know, but as of right now, there are no limitations by the government as far as uh, having big meetings together. So we're continuing to have church services. Um, as a matter of fact, just yesterday, there was a big uh, meeting of several hundreds of people up in Battambang with uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen. And so they're still, we're still allowing um, big meetings and that sort of thing. And so we're still meeting together as well. Um, but if you don't feel like meeting together in big groups, thinks it might be a little too risky, please know that we actually have all of our services online on our Facebook page. <clears throat> That's at New Life Fellowship, our Facebook page. We have every service that we do. So we have four services on Sunday. All of them are broadcast live on our Facebook. So you can worship in Kamai. You can worship in English. And we also repeat them on YouTube as well. So there is a, uh, I guess you could say a catalog or a, uh, there's a channel where we have all of our um, messages on there as well. So we upload those to YouTube. That happens usually in the middle of the week sometime. So you can actually go back and see our past messages as well. So we have online alternatives available. And should things happen where big, uh, big meetings or big groups get shut down, uh, you can find our messages there. We'll continue to upload those on a weekly basis as well. And um, we also want to emphasize small groups. Because if big groups get shut down, we want to continue to meet as a family. And if you read in Acts chapter 2, we were, were in Acts chapter 2 church. They met together for prayer, study the Bible, and look, uh, listen to the apostles' doctrine. They met together in small groups, broke bread. And that's what our model has been for years. But should things happen, it will swing even more to that. And that will be even more important. So get connected now. Get connected in a small group now, so if those things happen, you won't miss a beat. And also, we, have all, we also have options for online giving as well. And uh, we, yeah, there they are, right there. Uh, so if you have connections with ABA Bank or Canadia Bank or, so anyways, there's all the information. If you need, uh, if you want uh, some more information about giving online or giving through any of these services, uh, we have these little cards that you can take home with you today as well. You can get those out at the information counter. So, there you have it. Stay connected even in the midst of all of this craziness. Stay connected to God. Stay connected to the church as well. Amen? We've been going through a series on the Ten Commandments. How, how many people have been enjoying this series on the Ten Commandments that we've been doing? Yeah. Honestly, this has been one of my favorite ones that we've been doing uh, all of us uh, uh, preachers and teachers, and we always get together and we're talking about what we're doing and planning things out and getting our points together and stuff. And it's been really enjoyable just based on the perspective of each one of these commandments has a certain principle. And we've gone through four of them already. I'm just going to go back and kind of briefly summarize all of them. Uh, the first one... First command is, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. This was the principle of priority, putting God above all else. You shall have no other gods before me. 
This is the principle of purity. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth below or that is in the water under the earth. This is the principle of humility. The first one, you shall have no other gods before me. That was the principle of priority. No carved image. That was the principle of purity. Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Number three. All right, get these straight. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That was the principle of humility. Last week, we talked about the principle of rest, about taking the Sabbath every week. And then today, what we're talking about is the principle of honor. So let's look at this command in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Okay, let's read this all together, okay? One, two, three. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. All right, let's do it with a little more uh, uh, gusto behind it, a little more energy behind it. All right, one, two, three. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And all the kids said? Amen. 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 All right. This is an interesting one. Honor your mother and father. Because if we think about it, this is a command that God gave to the Israelites as they left Egypt. They were out in the wilderness. And, you know, we've reviewed it every single week. God redeemed them. And God saved them. God delivered them from slavery. And then he gave them the law. But this one here, it says, honor your father and mother. So God, in this command, is asking people to bring honor to imperfect humans. Imperfect humans. This, this would make more sense to me if it was, honor God, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. That would make more sense to me. Honor God. Yeah, I can do that. Honor God. But it's honor your mother and your father. This was after Adam and Eve, after sin, after all that. And God knew that he was giving a command to people to honor those who are in authority over them, even though they are imperfect and sinful. You know, everyone here, we all have different parents. Some good, some bad, some great, some not so great. But God says here, honor your father and your mother. And then we see the result of it. Why? That your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Why did God give us a command to honor somebody, to honor people, to honor our parents who are imperfect? This would be much easier if it was just said, honor God. It would be way easier if it, if it just said that. Yeah, I can do that, God. You're worthy of honor. Okay, you're perfect. But no, he said, honor your father and mother. The reason why God gave this is because when we honor parents and when we honor those who are in authority over us, we're recognizing the place that they have and the authority that they have, and the place that God has given them over our lives. And when we do, and when we submit to that, God does something inside of us. He does something inside of us that grows our relationship with him, but it also grows our relationship with other people as well. And so God wants to birth something inside of us as we submit to people who may be imperfect. You guys understand that? The greatest example that I can think of this is the example of David and Saul. Okay? David said, I will not lift my hand against the Lord's anointed. Saul was the first king in Israel. And then David was anointed as the second king, even before Saul passed away. And Saul began to get jealous of David. 
and tried to kill him, threw spears at him, all this sort of stuff. And, get, and there came opportunities where David had a chance to kill Saul. And he said, nope, I'm not going to do it. This is the one that God anointed. And he recognized something in Saul that he was David's authority, that he was chosen by God for that time. And I believe that in that time of submission and even running from Saul, God birthed something in David and actually probably took out the heart of a Saul out of David's heart. And so he learned about true submission and true leadership through submission. And I believe that that's what God wants to do in us through this verse as well. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. I want to read a verse. It's actually a number of verses. And I'm going to use this as our text for today as we go through some of our points. This is a story of a woman named Hannah. Hannah was one of two wives of a man named Elkanah. This is in the, in the, um, in the book of 1 Samuel. And Elkanah had two wives, and Hannah was the favorite. Okay? But Hannah didn't have any sons. The other wife had a, had a number of sons, uh, but Hannah had none. And every year, Elkanah would take his family and go to the temple to offer sacrifices at the temple. And every year, Hannah would pray, God, I want a son. God, I want a son. God, I want a son. And I want to read to you what happened here. In the temple, there was a priest named Eli. Okay. In the temple, there was a man named Eli. And Eli was not a very good priest. We see later that he uh, had some problems. And he wasn't the best of priests. But, and he was, he was imperfect. But Hannah recognized the anointing and recognized the man and recognized the mantle of a priest that was on Eli's life. And this is what happened. Listen to this story here. The priest Eli was sitting on a chair by the door of the Lord's temple. Deeply hurt, Hannah prayed to the Lord and wept with many tears. This is what she would do every year. She went and she prayed and she cried. She, she made a vow and she pleaded to the Lord. She said, if you will take notice of your servant's affliction, remember and do not forget me. Give your servant a son. I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and his hair will never be cut. While she continued praying in the Lord's presence, Eli watched her mouth. Hannah was praying silently, and though her lips were moving, her voice could not be heard. Eli, the priest of God, thought she was drunk and said to her, How long are you going to be drunk? Get rid of your wine. Okay? So this is the priest's response to a woman who's praying in the temple. Okay? How would you like it if the pastor came to, see, came to you in the middle of worship? Hey, don't be drunk. And <clears throat> yeah, that wouldn't probably go over very well. Okay? She said, no, my Lord, Hannah replied, I am a woman with a broken heart. I haven't had any wine or beer. I've been pouring out my heart before the Lord. Don't think of me as a wicked woman. I've been praying from the depth of my anguish and resentment. Eli, probably with, you know, words of honor to Eli. She said, Eli, the priest, I'm not drunk. I'm pouring out my heart to God. I'm praying. I'm crying. I'm speaking to God. So Eli responded, go in peace, basically, be gone. And may the God of Israel grant your request you've made of him. So he had this short, very curt little answer. Okay, yeah, go in peace. May God give you your request. But listen to this. She said to him, may your servant find favor with you, she replied. Then Hannah went on her way. She ate and no longer looked upset or sad. So she received the word from Eli. Eli was an imperfect priest. He had his problems. We see later on all that happened. But she valued the word. She valued the man, the mantle, the anointing. 
She valued the hand of God upon Eli's life so much that even the smallest word, she said, yes, that's the word of God. She said, I'm going to grab a hold of that word. I honor, I honor the man because God has put him in a place of authority. And at his word, at his word, she was changed. She said, that's the word for me. I'm going to take it. I'm no longer sad anymore. God answered my prayer. And it wasn't so much that Eli was perfect, a perfect priest. It was that Hannah honored the hand of God upon Eli's life. And to me, this is such a picture of honor. Honoring someone who is imperfect, but honoring God through him. You know, when we look at these commands, this is the fifth command. Honor your father and your mother. We have the first four already. What are the first four? There is no other God. You get that right? You are going to honor the word of your heavenly father through people, through imperfect people. Have no other gods before me. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Don't, have any, don't make any idols. These are all commands of honoring God and putting God in his rightful place. And then it gets to honor your father and mother. You can honor God through honoring your parents. Because God is the one who gave them to you. God is the one who puts authority in its place. And so as we honor the authority that's in, that's in place, we are actually honoring God who placed those people in authority. So the first point in this principle of honor is that honor produces faith. Honor produces faith. If Hannah had come to the temple and said, look at this Eli guy. Man, he's got problems. He's got this and that. He doesn't even know when somebody's praying. He thinks they're drunk. He can't tell the difference between a drunk person and someone who's praying in his temple. What kind of leader is he? He's not a very good priest. Do you think if she had that attitude, she would have latched on in faith or not? She would have said, ah, what's his word mean? His word doesn't have any value. He's just some guy who doesn't know the difference. No, she wouldn't have gotten the gifting. She wouldn't have got the blessing that day. She wouldn't have been changed. She wouldn't have been transformed that day if she hadn't had honor. Honor produces faith. And she was a person who said, yes, I'm going to cling to that word in faith because it came from the man of God. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You know, in Israel, the generation who received this command didn't have faith. The generation who received this command from Moses died in the wilderness. They had unbelief. This is what Hebrews chapter 3 says. I think we have this one on the slide. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 16 to 19 says, For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? This is talking about all those Israelites who received this command through Moses. Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. They didn't honor the word of God. They didn't treat it as valuable. They didn't give the word of God its rightful honor. And so they did not enter because they did not believe. They had unbelief. The reason that that generation wandered around and around and around and around and around in the wilderness for 40 years was because of unbelief. They sent the spies in. 
to see the land. And Joshua and Caleb came back, but ten came back with faith. They said, we can take this. Ten others said, no, we, can't, we don't believe that we can. And that, that unbelief spread through all of the Israelites and took hold. And as a result, they did not enter into the promised land. Honor leads to faith, leads to the promised land. If you want to go into the promised land and all that God has prepared for you, honor and faith are the way to do it. I want to read another verse. Someone else who did honor Jesus. Okay? This was in Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 to 10. There was a Roman centurion, a Roman centurion who met with Jesus. It says, when he had entered, when he had entered Capernaum, this is talking about Jesus, a, a centurion came for, forward to him. Now, this was a Roman. This was not a Jew. This was, a, was not someone who, you know, was the same nationality as Jesus. This was a Roman. They were the enemies of the Jews at the time. They were the people who all the Jews hated. They wanted to get rid of the Romans. They wanted to have independence from Rome. But a Roman centurion came and met with Jesus and said, Lord, talking to Jesus, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, and Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. The centurion honored Jesus. And he valued the word of Jesus. He said, all you got to do is just say the word. Just say the word. For I too, listen to this. I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell them go and they go. And to another he come and he comes. And to my servant do this and he does it. And Jesus, when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. This was a Roman, and Jesus was praising him as the man with the highest faith in all of Israel. It wasn't a Jew. It wasn't even a Samaritan. It was a Roman. And, 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 and why? Because this man knew about authority. This man knew about honor. This man knew that all Jesus has to do is say the word. He's just got to say the word. We, he, he lifted and valued Jesus and his word so much that all he needed to do was just say, Jesus, come on, just, just say the word. You don't even have to come. Just say the word. And because I know that I can do the same thing with, with all those people under me. And so we see that when we honor it works something in our lives as well. It creates faith. You know, I've been a Christian for a number of years, and in, in different churches, you see people who receive a word of God. Maybe they receive a promise, or maybe they receive a, a prophetic word from a pastor or a teacher who comes through. And there's some people who you just see, they just latch on to that word of God. This is the word of God for my life. I'm so grateful for this word. But then you see other people, they get God pray, you know, they get words from God and words from God and words from God over and over and over. But it doesn't do anything to change their lives. They're just like, yeah, okay, it's just another one. We need to be people who value and honor the Word of God, and the people who bring the Word of God to us. In our lives, we all have parents. We all have authorities over us. God wants us to honor them because through them, whether it's good or bad, God is working something in our lives through them. God wants to work something in your lives through the authorities that God has placed in your life. And we know that authorities and, uh, you know, parents and even pastors, even pastors can let us down sometimes. You know, pastors are imperfect people as well. 
But God, but let's be more focused on what God wants to do in us than what's happening in the situation around us. Honor produces faith. Honor produces blessings as well. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, if we continue the story, you know, Elkanah and Hannah, they end up going home. In verse, in verse 20 of 1 Samuel chapter 1, it says, After some time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. So she took the word of God from an imperfect priest named Eli and said, This is God's word for me. This is going to happen. And she took it in faith because she gave honor to God, God's hand on the man. And so as a result, she received blessings. Let's read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. It says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. So this is the same, the same promise from, uh, excuse me, from Deuteronomy chapter 5, actually. But it's from the law of Moses. And it says, honor your father and mother, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. You know, a lot of times we say to our kids, we say, you got to honor, you got to obey, so that you'll live a long life. You know? And normally we focus on the long life part of it. You know, I think parents, maybe they, uh, you know, they want to make sure their kids are obeying. You know, something might happen to you if you don't honor us or obey us. But it's interesting. It says, I think the part that we forget is that it may go well with you. Who wants to live a long life if things aren't going well? So we want to live a long life, but we want things to go well. Honoring and obedience are the way to do that. God, God wants to work something in each one of our lives through this principle of honor. It's a, it's a principle of honor, but it's a principle also of learning that we need to submit. Submitting when we don't want to submit sometimes. It says here, children, obey your parents in the Lord. And obedience is a big step for, for kids, and that's what they need to learn. As children, they need to learn that. But also honoring. And, you know, as parents, we're, as, when kids are real young, it's always like obey, 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 obey. Because they don't really understand the why or they don't understand, you know, you know what happens when this or that. We don't have, we, but as they get older... It, start, it starts to switch into the understanding of the principles and of the why the kids need to obey these things. And it's not just about do this, don't do that anymore, but starting to live by the principles. And as the honor of the children increases, also the freedom also increases because they understand the principles and they understand the why. And as they are giving their lives to these principles, it's not so much more about the obedience, but it's about the... Um, it's about the living by these certain principles. So we see here that there is a blessing as we honor as well. The obedience and then the honor that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. You know, John 10.10 10 is one verse that we always talk about a lot. You know, live that life. God, Jesus, okay, so let me read quote the whole verse the thief comes to steal kill and destroy but I have come Jesus word says I have come that you might have life and more abundant life that's this life in the land the long life in the land that God has promised to you and Deuteronomy chapter 5 quotes this that you may live long in the land talking about the promises the promised land that God has for us or that God had for the Israelites the promised land that God has for each one of us is a life of his abundant blessings. God has purpose for each of your lives. God has 
a, a promised land. Not, it's not talking about heaven, oh yeah, we'll have this when we get there. No, God wants you to live in that abundant life right now. And it comes through obedience, and it comes through honor. Now maybe you don't have great parents. And I know that there's lots of different kinds of parents out there. But God put those parents in your life. And God is the one who has given you life through those parents of yours. And I know that, I, I get it, I understand that, that life is tough. And sometimes we can feel that we are wounded or scarred by things that we have experienced in our life or you know, things that have happened because of our parents. God's not asking you, God's not asking us to say that, yeah, everything's fantastic and amazing and awesome and all that sort of stuff. But what God's saying is that we need to honor our parents. And we need to honor those people that God has put in authority over our lives. Because when we do, God births something inside of us. I believe that as Christians, We, in every situation that we face, God wants us to learn something and God wants us to grow from it. And when we have difficult situations, when we have difficult situations with our parents or when we have difficult situations with people who are in authority over us, God wants to do something in each one of us. God wants to do something in our hearts. And God wants us to, to grow and God wants us to um, have a heart of compassion. Because as we understand that, look, these, these parents of mine, these authorities that are in authority over me, they're not perfect. And I understand that. And you know what? We can say to God, God, I'm not perfect either. I'm not perfect either, but I love them. I love them, and they're the ones that you have put in authority over my life. And so what can we do to honor those parents of ours when there's difficult? Can you guys hear me? Okay. All right. I don't know if I'm switched a little bit here. How do we honor these parents? One, I believe we pray for them. We pray for our parents. You know, we want people to pray for us. We need to pray for our parents, those who are in authority over us, those who are, maybe you're out of the house, maybe they're not in authority over you anymore, but God is still expects us to pray for them and lift them up and, and, and honor them. And just like we said at the beginning, when we pray, we pray with thanksgiving. And I believe that when we pray with thanksgiving, you say, God, I thank you for my parents. I know that maybe they were, they're, not, they're not perfect, and, but I know and I believe that they, were, they did their best with my life, or they are trying to do their best with my life. I pray you would bless them. I pray that you would give them wisdom. I pray that you would help them. And as we pray out of a heart of compassion and a true heart for them, the love that we have for them will grow as well. And that's the second point that we can do to honor our parents is to love them and show them the love of Jesus. There are several verses. Read uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. God expects us to honor our parents. God expects us not just, to, not just in word, but in the things that we do. That even when our parents get old, we're to take care of them and to support them and to be a blessing to their lives. And I love the Cambodian culture that has such a high value of honoring your parents. I think that is such a wonderful thing. And I think a lot of countries in the West can learn a lot from uh, the Cambodian culture here. Um, even in one of the favorite things that I've, I've seen in Christian weddings is uh, the, the foot washing. That's not a Western thing. That totally comes from a Cambodian, you know, love and serving and honoring the parents. And I just think that's such a beautiful thing that when we show love to them, even if they're unsaved and imperfect, that just does something, melts their heart, and shows them the love of Jesus to them. And that's what God wants us to do. The third thing that we can do to honor our parents as well is to forgive them. 
And sometimes that's a daily exercise that we need to do. Uh, sometimes there's lots of things that happen. Sometimes it's, there's really some really deep wounds that might be there, but the forgiveness is a key thing because God's telling us that we need to honor people who are imperfect. You know, it's not honor God. You know, that wasn't the command. It's honor your father and mother. And so part of that is that continual forgiveness, that continual say, God, this was tough what they did. This was really tough what happened, but I'm going to choose to forgive because it's your command, but I want to live in the principle of honor. And the last thing that happens when we honor is honor produces destiny. In the story of Samuel, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel. Samuel was a mighty prophet. He was a mighty prophet who changed the course of Israel's history. She gave him to the Lord. Samuel was raised up by Eli, the imperfect prophet. But God used Samuel in a mighty way. And the destiny of a nation was changed because of the honor of a mother. Because Hannah gave honor to Eli and to the words of God through an imperfect priest. And as a result, the destiny of Israel was changed. Eli, or sorry, Samuel went on to anoint Saul and David, the greatest king in Israel's history. And this was the destiny that was changed. Honor produces destiny. God has a promised land for you. The promised land is the overcoming Christian life on this earth. It's what God has promised and declared for us. But a key to it, to us going into that, unlocking that, is honoring. Honor parents, honoring those who are in authority over us. So those are the things that we need to do to honor. Pray for our parents. Love our parents. Forgive our parents. Give them the honor that they deserve. And it's, it's not so much, it is about honoring a person, but you're honoring, when you honor those in authority over us, you're recognizing God and the fact that God placed them in authority. You're recognizing the hand of God in your life through your parents. They have taught you. They have raised you. They have provided for you. They have done all of these things for you. And even though they may be, may be imperfect, you can say, God, I'm going to honor my parents. I'm going to honor those in authority. You put them in that place. And just like this, the Roman centurion, he was a man who understood about authority. And as we honor, we will begin to learn about authority. And we will begin to be better people. Because there will come a time when God, if, if you honor and you respect those who are in authority over you, God always lifts those people up. God always promotes those people. And you're going to end up being someone in authority. Maybe you're going to be a parent or you're going to go up to the next level in a job or, you know, wherever you, God has placed you. But you're going to understand about authority because you have chosen to submit. And you're going to understand how to deal with those people under you as well. So honor produces faith. Honor produces blessings, yes. And honor produces destiny. So the, this is the principle of honor. And this is how God wants us to live based on this fifth command here. Amen? Let's all stand up together. Let's all stand up together. And I'd like us all to do something. I, I try to get us to respond to the Word of God every Sunday that we meet together. Not just listening to something, but doing something as well. And so I'd like all of us to respond by praying. And let's pray for our parents and pray for those that God has placed in authority over us. Maybe you need to begin, maybe you've never prayed a thanksgiving prayer over them. 
where you've really thanked God for my parents. Maybe you've never prayed a prayer of forgiveness and you need to do that. Maybe you need to pray a prayer of blessing over their lives. Maybe you need to do all three of these things. But let's lift up our voices. Just spend a couple of minutes praying, honoring our parents before the Lord, thanking them, thanking Him for them in our lives. Let's all lift up our voices and do this. Dear Heavenly Father, today we come before you, O oh God, and in faith we respond to this principle of honor, and we pray for our parents. God, we pray your blessings on them, O oh God. May you be like a good shepherd to them. May, be, may they come to know you in faith. God, I pray that you would provide for them. I pray that you would lead them. I pray that you would restore them. I pray that you would help them in every decision that they need to make. Lord God, I, I thank you for our parents. Lord, I thank you for those who have sacrificed for us and have given, to, given for us and have opened up their doors for us and have welcomed us and have, have blessed us with home and with family. Oh God, I thank you so much for them. But Lord, we also recognize that parents are imperfect as well, oh God. And so we release your forgiveness over their lives, oh God. And we choose today to forgive those parents, Lord, that have hurt us, maybe intentionally, maybe unintentionally, but we choose to forgive them and say, God, we release healing to them. Lord, we will not harbor bitterness in our hearts anymore. We will not hang on to that hurt, but we release it in forgiveness to them. Lord, we thank you so much, Lord, for our fathers and for our mothers. We thank you for their blessings in our lives. And we thank you for leading us to honor them and give them the honor that they deserve. Thank you so much for meeting together with us today, dear, dear Heavenly Father. I pray your blessing upon each person here today, each person who's watching online. And Lord God, we just thank you for your goodness. And we honor you, and we honor your word, and we honor those who are in authority over us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless all of you guys. See you guys all next week. As always, we have leaders up at the front here. If any of you...